Hello and welcome back. All right, so this is not how I would have normally played this scenario, okay? Because I think this is very, this is very aggressive conquest, okay? And this normally upset, upsets a lot of people around you. You need to be a little bit more skilled with your conquest. There's one other thing you can do as well. You can make someone a vassal, which basically just means you are below the lordship of the nation. So in that case, if you, uh, let's say if you were a king, someone who would below you would be a duke. If you played Crusader the Kings 2, you probably... You probably get what that means. So if you're below, below your liege, you still have autonomy over your lands. You still control them. But you are owned by your overlord. Your lord above you. In this case, a king. Uh, I guess we could do that against another nation, I suppose. Is there another nation we can do this with? I guess. Maybe. So it's just a different way of take. It Usually, if you make someone a vassal... And put them beneath you. It usually doesn't result in them getting all the your neighbors getting as upset. You don't get as much aggressive expansion. Uh, but then you've got to deal with other things like because vassals can be rebellious at times as well. And I don't know there's a lot of things going on really. It's not as straightforward as you just get the land from them. There's a lot of other things going on. But anyway, besides of that, I feel like I don't want to talk too much about vassals because at the moment I can't demonstrate it, and I feel like I should only show things that I'm demonstrating. So our economy right now is quite frankly crap. Okay, so we hover over here. You can see the treasury, the outgoings, and the incomings. You can get an overview by looking at the ledger and clicking on economy. And this is the number you need to worry about. This is the key number. It says the balance. In this case, it shows minus six ducats per month. This is the total amount of ducats we have. We have 580 ducats in the treasury. So, as you can see, the fleet causes uh, about just shy of a one ducat a month. About 15 ducats a month for the army. Rooting out corruption costs 3.1. Missionaries are costing 0 0.4. Forts cost six. State maintenance costs 2.44. State maintenance is not something you can really do something about, but you can tweak and adjust things to reduce that overall number. And there's your uncoming taxation, production, and trade. So, the easiest way to avoid, um, well, losing too much money and balancing the books, put it that way, um, is to, well, sort out some of your outgoings. In this case, we've got six forts. So, as you can see, forts are here. Uh, a fort has a, well, there you go. You can, you can do two things to a fort to save money. You can completely destroy it, which is there's a fort here, there's a fort here, there's one here. Uh, you do start off with quite a lot of forts as the Ottomans. And quite frankly, you don't even need that many. So let's just get rid of some of those forts, okay? So let's have a look. Where can we get rid of them? So there's two forts here, almost right sitting next to each other. Quite frankly, you don't need that many forts. So this one, I think we're going to get rid of. We're going to destroy this fort completely. Boom, it's gone. If you look at the outgoings now, it's gone from six ducats a month to five. So we're saving money, boys. Thinking about that economy. We've got to think about that big, big, big nation's credit card bill, right? Okay, there's a, there's a fort here too. There's a fort here too. I actually like these forts because these ones kind of block out incoming. There is something called zone of control. Okay, so this is a bit of an advanced mechanic, but I'll tell you it anyway. So here you go. This is zone of control. I'm going to wait a few days, actually, because I think that's wrong there. In a month. There you go. So here we go. Zone of control. So what is zone of control? Zone of control means areas around a fort, can, you cannot move through them unless you siege down that fort. So let's say I go into the war against, I don't know, the Golden Horde. They invaded my nation. They could occupy all this land up to here, but they would not be able to move through this area of Ankara further westward until they siege down this fort, unless they were able to get around it somehow. I'll just see if I can bring up the zone of control again. Uh, where is it? Where is my zone of control? It's one of these ones. I was just on it just a moment ago. I don't want to use my own because I've customized this because you can move these in yourself. Um, you won't use all of these ledgers as often. I'm just using them now. Here we go, fort level. So the green means there's a fort there. Uh, the slightly dark means there's a capital and it's a fort, so that's a high level fort. That means it's difficult to fort down, a bit like this one here. And the checkered lines means it's a zone of control. So you can move into these regions, but you can't move any further into it. So it's kind of like if you move into this region, you will not be able to move into that one or that one. You have to back out of this one to go into that one. So th can you get what I kind of what I mean? Does that make sense? Zone of control is quite hard to get your mind around, but... The way it works is if you enter a zone of control area, which is one of these checkers, you can't move um, into another checkered area 
unless you siege down the fort or you back out to a grey area. Does that make sense? I'm sorry, this is really confusing, but the area, what you can do with zone of control is you can make areas that are impassable to the, your enemies, so they have to siege forts down before they can move further forward. Because at the end of the day, you want to defend your capital. If you lose your capital, the, the enemy gets a bonus war score, and it also damages your whole nation based on war exhaustion, which is a mechanic we've not talked about. But defending your capital is quite vital. Anyway, so there's a few forts. Uh, one of the strategies that a lot of players use is they get rid of all their forts completely. Um, we, we could do that, but I don't really want to. Uh, da, 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 da. I guess for demonstration purposes, we can get rid of this fort, because this is just defending this area. Got rid of that one. And I, I also want this one in the middle as well. I like this middle one. All right, that's boom. As you can see, we now have only a fort maintenance three. So, deleting a fort is quite drastic, because that fort's gone, and if you want to build another one, it's going to cost you like 200 ducats. And it'll cost you like take like three years to build another one. Castles take a long time to build, okay? One of the things you can do is go into your military tab. And you can mothball forts. Mothballing a fort basically means is there's no maintenance being directed to that fort. That means the walls are crumbling. Uh, there's not troops permanently um, stationed in that area. And it basically means that it's left unoccupied. If... An enemy army comes into here, they'll be able to siege it down as quickly as a normal state. So, pretty quickly. And it's really hazardous if they do, because if they siege it down, you have to siege it back off them. Which, more than likely, if they occupy a fort, they'll unmothball it. I mean, they'll put their own troops in there, and therefore, um... Well, in that case, you have to siege it down off them, which will take a lot longer than they, they took for you, put it that way. Uh, we're notified that the Papal States has lost our rivalry with us, so we can rival someone else now. Which will rival the Mamluks. It's always good to have rivals because you build more power projection. As you can see, we've eclipsed the Papal State in plus 10. Eclipse just basically means we become more powerful than that nation. Therefore, we don't match them in a rivalry state. So, therefore, it's not really worthwhile um, uh, keeping them as a rival. Well, we, we don't have the ability to keep as a rival. We can have a new mission as well. We can go for the City of the World's Desire, which is owns Constantinople. So it's a mission objective to own Constantinople, which gains more legitimacy, which we're going to go for that one now. We get a, we get a Casus Belli against Bi Byzantium, which is a conquest one against Constantinople. As you can probably see, also gain a claim. We'll talk about claims a little bit later. Okay, so we also have a few new buttons we need to take care of. So we have a Peasant's War that's going to fire. So a Peasant's War is a disaster. Um, if you have a disaster that fire, you have to meet a certain attributes, and eventually when the when it fires, it causes uh, you to suffer from some other detriments and some benefits. In this case, a peasant war fires because you have manpower less than 50%, and your manpower is less than 1. Uh, sorry, your stability is less than 1. In this case, your stability is minus 2. So to stop a peasant's war from happening, uh, you need to get above stability. So this is a little bar at the bottom. It moves from left to right, getting 1.5 per month. And it lets you know that if you move all the way to the end, you suffer from a penalty of unrest plus 5, which is really bad, and stability modifier plus 50%, which is also really bad. And in that case, you don't want that to happen. That's bad, 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 bad. So we're going to gain stability, and we're going to sort that out later. Oh. Okay, so let's play the game. We've got two big armies here. I'm going to move them all over, right-click them here. We've got Wuttenberg Demand Ottoman Supply, and we gain some buffs. Mer the merchants are happy, but plus 10 loyalty and some trade power and trade goods. None of those stats mean anything to you because I've not talked about any of them. So you don't even know what they mean. You don't even know what they mean. Okay, so let's stop for a moment. So I put my whole army on this region of... Uh, that one. And there's a, a skull icon here. Well, the skull icon means this: these guys are suffering from attrition. 0.7% per month. So 0.7% of this army, the total army, will lose manpower and they will die every month from position in this area. And you're asking the question, but why, Dave? Why is this happening? Well, in this case, it's because the army is too big for the amount of supply that's coming out of this area. If I click on the area, it's woods. And there's just not enough food. Uh, supplies, well, food, or I guess it's food, isn't it? To actually keep this army in tip-top shape. So disease spreads, and, do, and the dudes die. So we want to fix that. We want to make sure that doesn't happen. Well, there's two ways of doing that. You either put them into a, an area that has more supply, which in most cases has farmlands or plains. Areas which food can be grown. In this case, we'll select the army. 
And if you hover over the areas, it says how much supply there is. 23. So that can support 23 brigades. 27. 28. 32. As I say, this is for farmlands. Farmlands do get a massive bonus to supply. Because it's covered in food. Look at the delicious food in this region. Look at the food. Yeah, so in that case, you can move that army here. And we will do that. Right click, go here. This is not the best way of doing it, really. You're better off just splitting your army into two. But there you go. So move them here. See, they're suffering from attrition still. Oh, no, they're dying. And then you move here. And look, no more attrition. And as you can see, over monthly, as monthly goes by, you gain more manpower. And the armies are getting reinforced. This army's maximum reinforcement of 28 now. And we are getting more manpower into our manpower pool. You always want troops in your manpower pool. You re regain them per month. You hover over it. It shows you how much you get. And you gain manpower based on the total amount of manpower development in your overall nation. Which is indicated by this military icon in each individual state. Uh, province. Yeah, these are provinces. Alright. So, what you want to do now is to... You don't want to be conquesting straight away. Conquesting? Is that even a word? Uh, you don't want to be conquering straight after this because you're coring this land. You see the percentage is increasing? This means we are coring this land. We want to core this land before we continue because you are suffering from aggressive expansion, which is really bad. Okay, an event's fired right here. It gives you an option for a trading family to gain train power in Aleppo. Trade power in Aleppo. You go into the trade mode, which is... Uh, let's have a look. Which trade? Where's trade? Trade, here we go. So every area of the map has trade going through it. Each individual region has trade. This one's called Constantinople, and this is the trade node here. And this one is Aleppo. So this gives you extra trade in Aleppo, so I mean you get more money from trade in Aleppo. Or, the other option for this event is to gain a trader, a Turkish sunny trader, called Kazim Keski. And he has two skill, and he will gain 10% extra trade if you hire him. And he will be 50% cheaper, because he loves you. In that case, we're going to bring him to our court <coughs> and find him. I think he's under diplomatic. Where is he? Here he is. Here's the guy. So as you can see, there's two guys here, identical here. They're both traders. They both have different names, but they do the same thing. But one of them, if you know it, is 50% cheaper. <gasps> Oh boy, and he's 31 years old, he's so young. So this will gain extra trade efficiency, which literally means extra trade income. So 10% extra trade income for your whole nation is amazing. And plus two diplomatic points per month. And he's 50% cheaper, and that's how much he'll cost. We're going to hire him. Hired. You do pay uh, upfront costs for hiring someone as well, which is a 16 uh, ducats in this case. Binder's fee. Binder's fee. And there you go, we're hiring a dude. And we'll go back to the political map mode, which is this one, and go here. All right, brilliant. As you can see now, our income is showing green. What does green mean? Green means we are earning money instead of losing money. So in this case, we are gaining 3.68 ducats per month. And we've done that by deleting some forts and mothballing them. One strategy you find a lot of YouTubers do do is they mothball their whole forts or they delete all their forts in one go. Uh, be aware that deleting all your forts or mothballing them all the time will be a nightmare because the AI will run around you like crazy and it will make the game very, very annoying. So for less annoyance, you can have a little bit less money, which I think is a good trade-off. Anyway, so we are getting manpower per month, which is good. Let's talk a little bit about estates. So your nation isn't just based upon you as a monarch and direct control of your nation. You have to deal with people who live in your nation as well. And in most cases, the peasants aren't the ones you have to worry about. Surely you get events that kind of make your peasants do different things. But the main people you want to deal with are the people who have power in your nation. In this case, the Ulmura, which is the, the aristocrats, the lords, the dukes, the counts. Uh, the Ulma, which are the religious people, the priests, uh, the people who are Muslims and whatnot. The, the actual, the kind of hierarchy of the church. Uh, trade merchants, which are basically, uh, I don't know, capitalists, I suppose you can imagine them as. The people who hold a lot of money, the merchants. And in this case, is it Demini? I think I might have pronounced that wrong. And these are basically, uh, wow, how do I describe these people? These are people... It is originally a term reserved for Christians and Jews. The Domini are non-Muslim subjects of the Muslim realm. Their status and privileges are, are very greatly between different states. There's both organization numbers. So it's kind of like... Kind of giving powers to other religions within a Muslim nation. These are unique to Muslims, by the way. So it's basically the ability to give power to non-Muslims and kind of recognize their religion as such. That's the best way I can describe it. I don't know how to describe it, really. 
Anyway, so you can have, you've got points of loyalty, how much, how much, how much they love you, how much influence, how much power they have in their nation, and finally how much land they control in their nation as well. One thing we can do with them is our uh, estates is extract certain things from them, ask for privileges off them to get benefits and buffs and whatnot. And one of the things we want right now is admin power because we need to increase our stability. And the guys who control the admin are the Ulma. The guys who control the diplomatic power are the merchants. And the ones that control the military power are the Ulmera. This would be a lot easier if these were English names, wouldn't it? For the purpose of this game, I'm going to call these the, the aristocrats, the church, and the merchants. Yeah. So click on their interactions, and we have the ability to demand diplomatic support, which gives us fifthly diplomatic power. One thing you can also do as well is seek support of the clergy, which gives them extra loyalty and extra influence of plus 15 loyalty and plus influence. If they have more influence, you gain more benefits from these points. Uh, in that case, if we go for this, it makes them really happy and we gain some more benefits. But we also get to go for diplomatic power, and we still get 50 anyway, never mind. Sometimes if the influence is higher, you do gain more power, but in this case, we've not gained as much. In this case, we're going for diplomatic power. We lose some loyalty, and we gain some more points. Yay! If we go into stability now, we can increase the stability by one. Spend 136 admin points, and it will increase stability. We're not going to do that, though. Why, Dave? Well, if you've got overextension, you pay more to increase your stability. So we're going to wait for the overextension to end by all these lands to be cored. You go into... You go into... Where is it? Where's the overextension? There you go. So you get 41% overextension causes stability to be incre stability increase cost to be plus 20. So in this case, if we wait for all this land to cool, it won't cost plus 20. Improvements of the production technology, we can gain some inflation to gain some admin. And I think that's definitely a good trade-off because we need the admin right now. We need it. Uh, inflation is a mechanic we've not really talked about. Let me talk about admin, uh, inflation. Inflation is here. Uh, there's lots of elements in the game that increase your nation's inflation. One of the most common ones is to take loans. Uh, inflation just uh, inflation just increases the cost of everything, basically. Uh, you want to keep your inflation as low as possible. below, Usually about below 5%. Over 5%, you start to get some really bad events firing in the game. Um, and those events cause all the bad things. It's kind of a bit of a snowball effect. Just be aware that inflation is bad. Alright, that's good. We're going to wait for this land to core first. Do, 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 do. The kind of the sound of like the purse coins and the shekels change. That means that end of a month. You can see the month ending. A talented judge. Bulgaria gets a talented quai. Or you gain a statesman, which is fifty percent cheaper. I think we we'll go for the statesman. The construction cost is something we've talked about with the forts. Unrest is self-explanatory, and state maintenance is what you saw on that front screen. And it will decrease there until 16, uh, 1463, which is 10... Uh, is that 10 years? 15 years. Yeah, 15 years. Or you hire this guy. I'm going to hire this guy, but I might not... Well, I'm going to bring him to my court, but I might not necessarily hire him. The Bulgarian guy. It was Bulgarian, wasn't he? Was he Bulgarian? I'm not even remember now. Oh, it's this guy. But we've already, you can only hire one of each type, so in this case we can't hire another one. This will give a diplomatic reputation plus one, which is a way to boost relations with the people around you. It's something we'll talk about later. It's a weird start, diplomatic reputation, because it only affects like a small niche number of things. Anyway, we've called all this land. It is now belongs to us. It is integrated with our nation. You can see it's integrated. One thing to know, it's another thing to know about, is there's two kinds of lands that are called. There are states and there are territories. A state is an integrated part of your nation that, I guess, in a way, has a say over the overall nation itself. It's an integrated part that's centralized and connects directly to your home government. On the other hand, a territory is a nation that has more autonomy. So in that case, it kind of is more distant from your capital. In this case, if you click on diplomatic here, you can see this is all states and this is a territorial core. So, as you probably would imagine, because this area has autonomy, you don't have all the benefits of a normal state. You gain less income, uh, you gain less manpower, you gain less production income. Uh, overall, it is more disconnected from your overall nation. You have a maximum limit of the amount of states you can have within your nation. And as time progresses, you get access to more and more and more states. 
In this case, it's indicating we have a new state that we can assign. In this case, there are two states. There's one here, which probably attaches to some of these provinces. And we have one here too. In this case, we're going to select this icon and make it a state. And this one too. Make this one a state. There is a map mode for this. States and territories. Here you go. So as you can see here, this state consists of this ter this st this state consists of these provinces. All of these ones, Aleppo. With all these four. That one. That one. That one. That one. These are all Aleppo. Now this, on the other hand, consists this area of uh, Dulcadur consists of all these four. One, two, three, four. So there are some states that fall outside of our territory, but. As you can see, that's what we've done. Okay, so one other thing to know as well, once you've made a territory into a state, you must core it to gain all the benefits of that state. That happens instantaneously, though. You spend all the points, and there they go, immediately onto yours. There you go, and that is fully now integrated into your state, and it belongs to your nation, it is centralized, and you gain all the powers and whatnot. Does that make sense? I don't know. I don't know if I'm making sense. Anymore. Anyway, we're going to increase stability as well. Now it costs 115 admin points. It is a little bit more costly because of religious unity, but that's the problem of being a, uh, a multicultural nation. Stability is a problem. <laughs> well, I got really political for a second there. There you go. Plus one stability. Done. Okay, so one other thing to note as well uh, is the looming disaster that we've talked about. So now we're at 30% for sales of the looming disaster. Well, like, I think this is on its way down now. No, it's still on its way up. We have to get more than... We have to have more than one stability to get rid of this. Remember, the disaster hasn't happened yet. Yeah, the disaster hasn't happened yet. It's 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 disaster that is more looming. And you have to sort it out before it actually happens. Most of the disasters are actually a massive pain in the ass. You need to deal with them immediately. Otherwise, you're going to run into a lot of problems. Okay, that was an event Tell me that the Moldova. Is it Moldova? It's got a spy network on us. We'll worry about that later. I don't want the forts. Okay, we have an ability to tech up now. So, as you play the game, you occur more and more monarch points. The amount of monarch points that you occur is based on the monarch that is on the throne. In this case, it's Sultan uh, Mehmed II. Faith. Who the fuck is this guy? Anyway, this is the ruler anyway. He's 17 years old, and like quite frankly, he is a god sultan. He is a great king. Remember, Sultan is basically a king of a Muslim nation. Uh, he has six admin skill, which is the maximum you can get. You can't get any more than six. It's between zero and six. He has four at diplomatic skill, and he has six military skill. Quite frankly, he is an amazing leader. He is a god. Every month, you gain six admin points, four diplo points, and six military points, as you can see at the top of the screen. There are other modifiers that affect the amount of points you get per month, but for the most part, these are the main ones that cause the biggest impact to your nation as a whole. When you gain enough points, you could spend these points by upgrading your technology in the game. In this case, Military Tech 3, which is our current skill level for military, has the ability now to upgrade our military by cost spending 600 of our military points and upgrading our military technology to 4. And you can see what it does. It increases morale. And it also increases tactics. Tactics is... is I'm not going to talk too much about tactics. But all you need to know about tactics is... If you've got a tactical advantage of your enemy... You do, you just overall have more... Inc uh, you have, have more... Uh, more luck in battles. Put it that way. Anyway, we're going to upgrade that technology. We are now... I've got the Pike Square. It tells you a bit of history. It tells you what it does. Remember, you always want to have a technological lead, albeit the same technology as the enemy you find. Otherwise, you will suffer from some, some crazy penalties to combat. And you've been scratching your head thinking to yourself, why am I losing this battle? I don't understand why I'm losing it. Well, the truth might be is you're behind on technology. One good way of finding out a technology is just looking on the map itself. You can right-click on a nation. It tells, it tells you what tech they are. Throw it 3, 3, 3 for everything. 3, 3, 3. 3, 3, 3. 3, 3, 3. 3. Three, two, three, three, two, three. As you probably can see, because our our king, our sultan, is amazing. Everyone else is, is behind on technology, but we're up to date. Anyway, let's resume the game. Okay, let's talk about the navy a little bit as well. So, also, like Forge, you can mothball the fleet as well. So, if you're not using your fleet, you can mothball them. Here you go. H to mothball. 
It does the same thing. It basically means the fleet is inactive, and over time the fleet will decay. I think it loses about 10% of its, or 5% of its durability per month. Um, the downside to this, as you imagine, if you need to go to war, you have to build up and repair your ships before you go back to war. So it does cause a bit of a, a bit of a problem. Um, yeah, so I think the I just I had a massive brain fog for a second. Then, yeah. So one thing to know is your fleet is useful, uh, which I'll talk about why your fleet is useful at, later in the game. But for the time being, uh, mothballing your fleet when you're not using it is a good thing to do. Um, yeah. Is that good? Yeah, I think that's fine. Brilliant. Alright, let's go. Okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. So, we're going to move our army over to this state. It's got 28 support limit. As you can see by that hovering over it. Supply limit 28. And we need to build up some more manpower. Manpower is unbelievably low. Let's see if we can hire someone that improves our manpower. Nope, there's no guy that has better manpower. We've got a fort guy. We've got a reinforced guy and a maintenance guy. None of those guys are applicable. But we are earning some good mo money right now. So, that's all good. We'll increase our stability. Oh, so someone has just entered a coalition against us. Okay, so as I said to you before, if you take too much land in one war, it does upset a lot of your neighbours, okay? Because you are seen as an expandist, an aggressive expander, and you must understand and recognise the sovereignty of nations around you. I know, that sounds crazy, right? What a bizarre idea, right? But anyway, yeah, so you must do that. And in this case, the Mamluks have uh, started a coalition against us. Crimea has joined this coalition, which is this nation here. Carmen has joined the coalition too. Eventually what will happen is the coalition will get large enough where it feels like it's brave enough to start a war against you as a nation. Remember, when you go to the peace screen, it says how much uh, aggressive expansion you're going to incur. If you get over 50 aggressive expansion, that's when a coalition will fire. And in that case, that's when they'll start to think about going to war against you. There is a map mode for coalitions, I think. There you go. So in this case, the ones in red means they have successfully join the coalition against you and they are plotting to unify and attack you to beat you down to size uh the ones that are in a different color are a little bit different different shade uh, they are considering joining that coalition you have to be over 50 aggressive expansion they're at 60 so they're quite frankly they might join the coalition 32 that ain't gonna happen uh 28 not gonna happen 36 not gonna happen remember they need to get a coalition that's big enough to actually start to declare war on you. Isn't it a Muslim themed event? It can gain mysticism and uh, all legalism. It's up to you. Let me just pause the game. Um, we're going to gain, in this case, we're going to go towards mysticism, which gains extra missionary strength, which converts quicker. Morale, which basically means you fight for longer and you fight harder. Morale is a bit of a weird stat. It means that. Yeah, it does those two things. It means that the higher morale you've got, the longer your troops will fight for before they back away. Which sometimes might be a bad thing, because if they've got a technological advantage over you, you may take more casualties, even though you're fighting for longer. And it also increases fort defense as well, which is 20% up to maximum. Remember, that's what, they're the full stats you get if you've got maxed out mysticism. But, if you hover over here, that's the what we're actually receiving. So 2.8 for morale, 5.6 for fort defense, and 0.8 for missionary boost. In this case, we're going to go for more mysticism, which increases those stats overall. Whew! There you go. And it also builds a shrine that gives plus two tax as well, which was the bottom one, which gives some more money. Uh, Razam Ramazan has joined the coalition too. Because there's a chance of a coalition forming, I want to make sure these forts are prepared for war. So we're going to remove the mothball status. So individually, if you go into your military screen, you can up the, all the forts and mothball all the forts. Uh, but if you can go into here, you can individually raise the forts up to bring them actually into combat. Uh, the truce with Venice has ended, which is a war that happened off screen that you didn't actually hear about. There you go, that's done. We've got a humiliate rival against Venice because they are our rival. We've got an option to either gain some prestige or in increase spy network. Both of the things I've not actually talked about. Uh, let's talk about prestige. So prestige ranges from minus 100 to a 100. 100 gains you lots of bonuses. Here are the bonuses you can get. As you can see, you gain more trade power, more morale for armies and navies, and less mercenary cost. More legitimacy, improved relations, a lot of those things I've not actually talked about. But all you need to know that more prestige indicates lots of free, awesome things. One of the best things is that you get extra morale. If you get 100, mor 100 prestige, you get plus 10 morale. And morale is really awesome because it improves your army overall. There are certain stats in this game that improve your army's fighting ability as a whole. And one of those is morale, although there is discipline. Uh, but for the most part, morale is a good one to go to because it's easy to access earlier on in the game. 
Uh, influential trade, family gains from trade power in Alexandria, so you got the trade zone, so this gain more trade power in Alexandria, or gain a Greek Orthodox trader, uh, which is 50% cheaper. Usually that'd be really awesome, but we already currently have a trader, so there's no point. So in that case, we'll go for the extra trade power. Um, just a little brief talk about trade power. If you go into the trade map mode, which is, uh, here, you can click on a node, you can see how much trade power you've got. This is a little pie chart. You find yours. So we're going to Constantinople. The green one is you. So 49% of this trade power is owned by you. More trade power you get from here means more income you can extract from the trade node itself, meaning how much money you could make. And in this circumstance, where you're making six ducats a month, and we have 49% trade power. More trade power that we give here pushes out trade of other nations, meaning we control the trade in the node. And in that case, we extract more money from the node. And there you go. And in this case, we have trade here too. I think we control 5%, so it's very, very small. There's two things you can do with a node. You can transfer power from the node, uh, tr transfer money from the node to your node, or you can collect. In this case, there's a merchant here. Gotta feel like I'm talking about too many things in one go here, but at the start of the game, you get two merchants, and you can collect and transfer. In this case, in this case, you can see here, you can see the arrows with direction they're going. So in this case, there's a merchant here transferring uh, trade from here to my capital, where I'm collecting here, and transferring from Alexandria up to here to collect from here. So, in this case, as you can see, you can also collect from those nodes if you want as well. Uh, but it, overall, it works out better to transfer other than collecting. Oof, that's, that's a lot to take on board because the trade system in this game is quite complex. But try and understand that you collect from your main node and you transfer from other nodes to yours to gain money. So, I could move a merchant here if I wanted to from one of my other nodes, Alexandria or Aleppo. And cause it to move trade down from Crimea to Constantinople where I'll collect and get money. Yep. Yeah. Alright guys, well, that's another one. If you enjoyed this, feel free to like and comment and all that jazz. Apart from that, I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.